Hey, good afternoon. How's everyone doing today? Woo! Awesome. So I am Kerba Marie Cattell. I am your moderator for this afternoon session. Super excited to be here. I am a peace and security specialist at the Ministry of National Security in the beautiful island of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and I also function as the Caribbean Coordinating Ambassador at One Young World. Woo. <laughs> and I'll be moderating today's session on women, peace and security with three amazing women. Right? So I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Ala Murabich, um, Noam, Shus sorry, Noam Schuster Eliassi, comedian, peace builder and activist, and Hila Yoon founder of the Afghan Youth Ambassadors for Peace organization, Ayapo. So welcome them. Great, let's just get into this session. So Hila, um, conflict disproportionately affects women and girls and reinforces pre-existing gender inequalities and discrimination. How can we ensure that women's and girls' needs are addressed? and taken into account when establishing international responses in conflict zones. Um, hi everyone. Um, I think when I started working on women, peace and security agenda, I didn't really know what UNSCR 1325 is. And also I think many young people don't really know about the women, peace and security agenda and youth peace and security agenda. And mm -hmm. there was a huge lack of knowledge about what national action plan actually is and how it can help with the implementation of women, peace and security agenda. So coming from my experience, because I'm from Afghanistan and I grew up in a conflict affected countries and when we had national action plan, often the needs of young women was not included in the national action plan in any policy development. The reason for that was like most of the international INGO consultants that were working with the government didn't have access to local CSO and women led organizations, especially by young women. Um, and that was one of the big gap that was uh, that why young women needs are not even included in when, while we talk about women peace and security agenda mm -hmm. because women when women face war they have different experience comparing to men and that's why we need to include them in development phase of any national action plan or any project because they come with different recommendations because they experience war differently. And for this, whenever we do advocacy um, and development of national action plan, we need to include young women, and especially young women from grassroots um, um, level, at the local level, because we, whenever we talk about young leaders um, and youth, uh, we always, the first thing that came to our mind is men, but not young women. We never talk about young women, it's always young men or senior women peace builders, but not young women peace builders, and that's something why we cannot have sustainable peace in so many countries. And even without that, whenever we come to costing and budgeting, there is no expertise or no experts um, that talk to young women that what are your needs, how we can give you funding, how we can uh, support you, how can we build your technical support. Um, and this is what we need to focus on more and for international community to actually engage and include women and young women in development phase the best way is to, localize, is to localize their policies. Localization is the best policy for sustainable peace and localization through young women peace builders, especially at the grassroots level. And that's how act actually you can include young women in development phase. Thank you so much. Like, I love that. <laughs> right? And she's so right, because oftentimes you realize that young women are not included from the very beginning, right? But it's always important to have them all the way through. And, uh, she would have mentioned that there are, um, as it relates to international organizations. So I've been thinking, Dr. Murabit, this would be where you come in. Um, so as the director of health at the Gates Foundation, very important position, right? And so as a woman in that position, um, we know that efforts have been made by some international organizations to advance women's roles as agents of peace. However, women still continue to be underrepresented in peace processes. In your opinion, what more needs to be done by the international community to ensure that women's equal and meaningful participation in peace processes, peace building, and security arrangements? So I first started working on women, peace, and security when I was 21 in Libya. 
I founded an organization called The Voice of Libyan Women. I went on to be on the advisory committee for UN Resolution 1325, which is Women, Peace, and Security, Security Council Resolution. And this was prior to, this was back in 2011, 2012. So this was before we had a Youth Peace and Security Resolution. And the vast majority of women I worked with, you're right, were senior peace builders um, or, or older. And, and, and oftentimes there would be almost a split of, you know, you should go work with the youth organizations that are working on local community initiatives. Um, and a huge part of the conversation was how do we engage women politically? And, and that was a lot of where the international community was. And so in the past 12 years, um, a huge amount of our work has been looking at how do we actually get the international community to appreciate the importance of having community voices, and not just in peace and security, but on all global development issues. So I'll give a story. This was back when I had first started my organization. Um, we had invited the UN, um, and, that I, and, I, and I admire what the UN can bring to the table, but in this case, it, you know, it was a little absent, because we had invited them, and they asked the local leaders, well, where are the women? There were only two young women in the, two women in the room, me and one other. And um, the, the, the local politician said to the UN representative, well, where are yours? Because there were absolutely none other than their gender advisor. And I think that's very telling. It is very difficult to go into communities and demand action that you do, you do not yourself have or yeah. do, and yeah. demand representation that you do not bring to the table, right? This is not a unique to conflict situations. Mm -hmm. This is fundamental in all of our political you know, institutions, in all of our peace building institutions. So a huge part of this has been, okay, are we collecting the right data to be able to say that this isn't a nice to have or a check box exercise, but that this is critical. And what we have seen, and, and this is all relatively new because we have not had women's engagement in peace and security for a very long time. But what we have seen is, and I'm sure somebody in the room actually knows the answer to this, how many peace processes usually will last five years or will fail within five years? Let's do it that way. How many peace processes fail within five years? Anybody? You know. <laughs> Our failed very badly. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's like based on ninety-nine percent. Ninety percent. Ninety percent of peace processes fail within five years. And when you have women and inclusive leadership at the agenda setting phase, you're looking at thirty-five times more likely to last fifteen years. Fifteen. Yeah. So if you think about the dividends then, right? If you think about how much you can build a country in those 15 years, the likelihood of it ever devolving back into conflict or devolving back into significant conflict is lessened. And so there's, there's a lot of, I think there's a way for us to be able to bring data to the table and say this is critical. I, I do think we need to also have an honest conversation about how economically attractive conflict can be. Yes. And why it is not always in everybody's best interest to maintain peace. That's an honest conversation we need to start having if we're going, to, because that, that fact can be very appealing to people who want sustainable peace, but people who don't are kind of like, oh, yeah, we really need to keep them out. So there's, there's different pieces of, of the challenge, and I think that local organizations like yours, I think you know, the incredible work that's being done by so many young women and young men to be able to bring more inclusivity to the table is critical, but I also think a lot of those local leaders need to start looking at taking on global positions of power and voice and authority, and we need to start electing officials and nominating officials into international bodies that bring that perspective as well. Yeah, and like that is so important because one of the things you also said would have referred to um, that all of society approach. So ensuring that everyone is represented when we do get to the table, because there's so many different issues that are occurring simultaneously. And if, and if each group is represented, then we're better able to genuinely get to a place where we can work towards solving the issue. So Noam, your question, um, Dr. Murabit would have mentioned, you know, that 15 year success, right? So according to UN Women, women's contribution to peace agreements increases the probability of the agreement lasting 15 years by 35%. In your opinion, how can local communities support women's engagement and participation in peace talks and conflict prevention? Yeah. Well, I'm so excited. <laughs> I've never spoken about women in security from an IKEA chair, so I'm very excited. 
I've been a, I've been a one young world ambassador since 2014, so I'm like a one old world, by the way. <laughs> now, um, I uh, um, I have so much to say. I used to work for the UN, and I was in politics and in peace building for a really long time, and then I switched to comedy before Zelensky, by the way. <laughs> uh, so now being like uh, in in the, you know in the action of doing cultural activism mm -hmm. and promoting you know uh, uh, peace reconciliation justice through arts and culture and and comedy and being on stages I connect a lot of what I was doing to the uh, in the UN and I and I have even more realizations um, than what I uh, I grew up in a very political home. My, my father was uh, actually a political prisoner in, in Israel. He was in, um, he was in military Israeli detention for refusing to serve in the occupied Palestinian territories and Lebanon. And during that time when he was in prison, all the eyes were on to my father. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. oh, what a brave blah, blah, blah. You're, you're resisting the occupation and you're doing your part in not going to war. And my mom is at home taking care of me and pregnant, paying a much bigger price than my dad who was like writing letters from jail, you know? <laughs> so women, women, we, <laughs> he was doing nothing. What is, <laughs> it's my mom who was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so uh, women, we don't only pay a bigger price in conflict, we also m most likely everyone's, you know, all of y your women in life, I'm sure more of them, not all of them, right? More of them know much better how to solve situations. Yeah. We're much more solution oriented. So my work with the UN was um, a peace building initiative called Interpeace, which was part mm -hmm. of the UN. And we were working with um, populations who were um, um, excluded from the traditional peace process or excluded themselves. Okay. So we're working with religious and right-wing populations and spoilers of peace. And when we took th the participants, who were mostly men, surprise, <laughs> to other conflict areas, to Northern Ireland, for example, the women who, the people who had something substantial to tell Israelis and Palestinians on how to stop excluding, excluding themselves from justice-oriented processes were women. Yeah. <laughs> were women who were part of the uh, women's coalition in the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland and many, many, many more uh, uh, examples. And why the, there is so much there is so much to say but yeah, yeah um, I know there's always especially when you're thinking about it from a woman's perspective because there are so many different things that we do like your reference to unpaid work like during during conflict that is really important as well so kudos to your mother and all the other amazing women right mm -hmm. who've done that as well um, so we just have a few more minutes. I know we have a full room. If you're up for, if you have a question for any of our amazing panelists, please raise your hand and we will pass the mic to you. Okay. Any hands? I'll start doing stand-up if you don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm down for that, so. I don't think you're gonna get many no's. <laughs> So true, because like one of the one of the things you mentioned as well would have been the importance of including culture when you're looking at peace processes. Because and sometimes we forget about that. So like especially in the Caribbean, there's also that aspect of introducing or speaking about peace and conflict resolution through comedy or through um, poetry and spoken word pieces. Because you're also trying to ensure that everyone understands what's happening in the situation. Yeah? I think that, because, sorry, before, mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, I, I want to say that I think because we are part of, I think, multiple generations who have uh, had lack of strategic leadership around us and we don't have actually role models um, in our politics and uh, we haven't witnessed leaders that have actually been inspiring to us long term. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of us turn into more creative tools and when a woman stands on stage and when a woman expresses herself and when a woman is political and when a, wo a woman is part of a social movement or a political movement, I think uh, in most societies it, it just has uh, a bigger impact um, because it, it most likely it is much, much, much more urgent for women. Um, not to say that men are the problem always, but 
you should. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, it is much more important from our perspectives. So I do have a, just an overall question, right? So any of you can feel free to answer. We're thinking about, so we are aware that to date, about 80 countries have in fact established national action plans on women, peace and security to implement UNSCR 1325. How can young leaders encourage their national governments to adopt similar agendas in order to increase the participation of women in peace and security efforts? Um, first thing is that this is from my experience, because in Afghanistan, one of the biggest struggles that we faced whenever we talk about youth peace and security agenda and young peace and security agenda, most young people are just hopeless. Because if you live in a country where there's constant war, trauma, it kind of takes a toll on you. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you don't really see a bright future. You don't really care about this big resolution where you have so many problems on the ground. There was one story when we went to one of the province and we were um, advocating and raising awareness about UNSCR and what is Women, Peace and Security Agenda. There were so many people who came to us like, we don't even know what the United Nations is. We don't even yeah. care what they do. We don't care about, we don't have food on our table, that's like our main priority. Why would I care about what UN says? Why would I care mm. about what this agenda is? And fair enough, because whenever you, big NGOs come to a country like Afghanistan, they never do conflict sensitive approach to their implementation. They never care about what's actually happening on the ground, what the, their priority or the needs of people are actually on the ground that they should consider. Every time we just talk about drafting, drafting, making new policy, we have so many policies at the moment. I yes. lost track like how many drafts, mm -hmm. how many angels are making reports. We don't have time to create new things or draft new policy. We already have them. What we need is implementation and accountability. Don't just hold um, the government where you're actually implementing these policies accountable, hold international NGOs accountable as well. Hold United Nations yeah. accountable as well. Hold, um, regional organization as well. Afghanistan is a perfect example. We had peace process for three years. So much money have been gone through the peace process. People coming from different countries, young peace builders, senior peace builders, they all had their thoughts and opinions about Afghanistan. And now we saw what the result was the, mm -hmm. of the peace process is. Whenever we talk about women involvement in, in peace processes, make sure it's not symbolic. We just don't want women sitting on the table and talk about their rights and this is what we need. Meaningful engagement is what's important is. Often a lot of men, even at the senior level, you'll be surprised how many men in the United Nations and ING even don't consider women to be involved in security issues yeah. or in conflict resolution issues. Whenever we talk to them, it's like, yeah, you'll be here just for the sake of uh, gender equality or just like saying, oh, we're including women, but they're just symbolic. Like we know the big talks where this is mostly men, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's what's important. Like, if we, we, we can talk, so there are already recommendations available. We don't need to come up with new recommendations. All we need is implementation, mm -hmm. accountability, and forcing these policies on the ground. Because if we're still wasting time of data collecting, doing all the process from again and again, it's just a waste of time. We have so many reports at this point. All, all everything United Nations do is keep reporting, analyzing, and that's it. No accountability and no implementation. Yeah. So implementation is and will always be think, a problem. I think Dr. one Rural. thing is very true. Yes, hold international institutions, hold national institutions, hold your government, hold regional institutions accountable. Hold yourselves accountable. Run for office. Mm -hmm. Run for office. Become the implementing party. Yeah. If you want things to happen, do that. Run for office. Go work at places like the UN. They will continue to make decisions globally. They are mm -hmm. the multilateral institutions. Run for your local government because something cannot be implemented unless it is resourced. And it will not be resourced unless people demand it. And there is accountability. And there is engagement. And it is one thing, and it is critically important to advocate. I will never, it is critically important to run local civil society organizations, regional, national, all of those things are critically important. It is how I started, it is how I think I, it is how I think you have credibility and bring mm -hmm. with you a perspective that is tangible to your community. But take that when you have access to places and conversations that have the kind of impact that you can have, own that. Be accountable for that. Do not go in only as a representative of yourself or your local community, create coalitions, create networks, bring more voices to the table, make it impossible for somebody to say no to you. And if they continue to say no to you, run for office. Run for office. 
yeah. and also hold people in power accountable you know in a, in, a, in a fearless way yeah I know but then just become the people in power right you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah at some point it's got I, yeah I agree with you there's a dearth of leadership and we talk about it all I mean in the 12 years that I've been doing this it's it's frustrating because you hear the same conversation and in fact it feels like we like ebb and flow and, right yeah, definitely. and we, we make some progress and then we go so incredibly backwards and now we're talking about post covid we're looking at 50 years backslide on women's rights and we're talking about gender based violence at heights we've never seen before and all of those are components of women's peace and mm -hmm. security right and all of those are components of community security and we keep talking about looking for leadership and i will be frank in that it's not that i am pessimistic. I'm incredibly optimistic about the leaders I see in front of me, mm -hmm. but not about the ones that necessarily are currently there. Yeah, I got you. And so if there's anything that we're to take from this conversation, okay, we have one quick question. Let's get it really, really quickly. No? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you raised your hand just a little bit too late. But if we, if one thing we do get from this collaboration is currency, create your own coalitions and to definitely run for office so that you have the power to make peace progressive and purposeful. Thank you so much for joining us today. You were an awesome audience.